Hello, and welcome to Taste and See. This is a Peace Church Sunday School class, and I am your host, Todd Blanchon. Let's see what the Lord can do with us during this time. Hello, and welcome to Taste and See, Lesson 4. We are using Taste and See that the Lord is Good, Psalm 34, 8, as our title for this series. And we're plumbing the depths of Psalm 34 to see how God really is good in all the different ways that he is good. And uh, this week we're going to talk about Psalm 34, verse 4. I will read it for you. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. That's interesting, isn't it, uh, given the times we live in? Do you ever feel like you have been seeking the Lord lately, and he has not delivered you from all your fears? What are you afraid of now? What is it that troubles you? There are lots of people who are afraid these days. They're afraid for many reasons, but we want to tease this out. We want to look at what others in the Bible have to say about God's rescuing us from fear and how it happens. And so this verse actually has two parts. The first part is, I sought the Lord and he answered me. And the second part is, and delivered me from all my fears. So let's take the first part. I sought the Lord and he answered me. You know, last week we talked about the prophet Jeremiah. And we talked about his most famous verse, which was uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, Which is, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Plans for a future. Well... The verse immediately following that verse, 29.12, reads like this. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. That's When you call upon me, I will hear you. When you seek me, you will find me, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. This is a clear invitation to come and look for the Lord. Let me ask you, have you looked for the Lord? Have you looked for him this week? Have you looked for him diligently? Have you looked for him with all your heart? I can honestly say that most of the time that I talk to the Lord, it is to solve a problem, to get my particular needs met for that particular day or to address a particular circumstance that I'm facing. Um, I, I often look to the Lord to solve my problems, in other words, not to find him. Now, this is for you guys who are out there. Um, when your wife talks to you about her problems, is she looking for you to solve that problem? That is the natural inclination of men. We want to solve the problem. She tells us about a difficulty with a, a girlfriend or a child or a parent, um, and we want to solve the problem. We want to give them advice that allows them to get that relationship straightened out, right? How does that go for you? I, I can tell you it doesn't... Uh, doesn't go well for me in my conversations with my bride. And interestingly, um, I find my wife 
does the same thing to me, too. Again, she's just trying to help, as I, I would try to help her, but uh, when I come home and I just want to complain about something or somebody, I just need her to listen. I don't, I don't really need her to solve the problem. I usually know that I shouldn't be complaining about this thing or this person. But they've aggravated me, and I just like to complain, so I do it. And um, and and the the problem that we have as people is that we are very task oriented. We like to like engineers or like mathematicians or scientists. We like to figure out the issue and solve the problem. And the Lord is saying, I really want to know you. And I really want you to know me because in truth, since I'm your creator and I do not sleep or slumber and I watch you day and night and my eyes are upon you and I look upon you and I love you and I've given you my son and I've given you all of these things to show you that I love you. I really want you to know me, to find me, to seek me out. I created you for relationship with me. That's why I made you in my image so that we could have a relationship. I did not make the beasts of the field or the stars or even the angels in my image. I made you in my image so that we could have a relationship. So seek me and you will find me. Who, who does this sound like? I mean, do we know a New Testament character that this sounds like? Could it be Jesus? Well. Glad you asked that question. In Matthew 7, verses 7, we get this from Jesus. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. And he continues. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts, good things, to those who ask him? That's verse 7 through 10 of Matthew 7. I'm speaking to the parents now. <clears throat> Do you ever wake up in the morning and decide whether or not you're going to love your children that day? I mean, that's a strange concept, isn't it? Uh, for anybody who's a parent. We don't, we don't wake up and say, okay, let me decide if I'm going to love my kids today. We don't. We wake up loving our kids. Now, depending on where your kids are in terms of their walk and their age and all sorts of things, there are many things that surround that, and one of those things might be that you're not particularly happy with the way your kids behave right now. Or maybe they've cut off a relationship with you, or maybe they're living a sinful lifestyle. And so there's things that you don't particularly like about that, but you don't stop loving them. Even the worst addict who is stolen from you, uh, even the most abusive child, still is loved by their parents. Now what God says directly from his own mouth, uh, i.e. the words of Jesus, is that, if you, who are evil, 
It's interesting you put that in there. If you who are evil can give good gifts to your kids, in other words, if your kids ask for a good gift, and it's within your power to grant it, you know, Daddy, can I have a sandwich? You're not going to give him a snake, are you? You're not going to give him a rock and laugh. Ha, 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 you needed something to eat, I'm giving you a rock. Of course not. God values us much greater than we imagine. Much greater. He made us in His image. And He loves us for that. And this is what Matthew writes about what Jesus said uh, in chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, i.e. God in heaven, knowing. But even the hairs of your head are numbered. They're all numbered. So fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. In other words, God knows you better than you can imagine. And he is not leaving you nor forsaking you. You know, our fears primarily come out of anxiety, anxiousness, uh, worry about the future. There are some practical fears, but the ones that come from anxiety, Jesus addresses, uh, and he does so in Luke 12 starting in verse 22, when he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? In fact, the truth is, this is my side note, stress actually shortens your life. If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest of it? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so chooses, or so clothes, the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Do not seek what you are to eat and what are you to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is your Father's good pleasure. You see, another way that God is really good to us is that he delights in us. And it's his pleasure to answer our prayers. So when you pray, Pray expectantly and look for his answer. You may be surprised how quickly he answers and what, in what ways he does. But he will deliver. He is the great deliverer. God is good and he is the good father. And Jesus came to show us the goodness of God. And the greatest gift that he can give us is himself. In him, we have everything that we've ever wanted. In him, we have joy. In him, we have peace. In him, we have unabounding love. In him, we have all the necessities of life. We were made to be in Him. And yet, we constantly in this life chase other things, don't we? We chase wealth and 
power, and influence, and purpose, and excitement. And these things all lead us to pride, they all lead us to sin. But when we actually seek God, he says we'll find him. Well, how, how can we do that? What, what is the primary way that he's given us to seek him out? Well, if you can read, read the Bible. And read it in a different way if you haven't read it like this in the past. Read it and say out loud to God, Lord, help me to find you. What is it that you want to say to me in your word? He calls it his word. In other words, it's, it's the, him speaking to us. And when we begin to read the Bible saying, what do you want me to hear from you, Lord, here? As opposed to, Lord, I really need this problem to be solved and I'm hoping to find the answer in these pages. Very different approaches. Once I changed my approach to reading the Bible, things changed. I, I began to know God much, much more deeply. Um, now to say that I know him as deeply as I ought would be a lie because there are just times when I want to solve the problem. But if we can start even a little bit, start looking at God and saying, how do you want me to know you? How do you want me to find you in this passage? You won't have to read far because the gift of his Holy Spirit that dwells in us will sharpen our minds. He'll, he'll, he'll ask questions about the passage. You know, God never wakes up and says, do I love Todd today. First of all, he doesn't sleep or slumber, so he doesn't have to wake up. But he always has the attitude that he loves me. When he looks at me and you in Christ, he delights. He smiles. He looks at us and he sees a child that he loves, that he has redeemed and is redeeming. And he just wants you to spend time with him. I recently had a, my fourth grandchild uh, born to me. I have beautiful, beautiful children, and I have beautiful, beautiful grandchildren, and uh, all babies and children are, are beautiful in my mind. But, you know, I just love to spend time with my grandchildren. I don't have to be doing anything in particular. I just want to be in their presence. I just like to stare at them. I remember when the first grandchild was born, staring at that child as I held her and looking up at the clock and realizing that a couple hours had passed. I looked at the clock and I was just astonished. I said, no, oh, that clock must be broken. That only seemed like a few minutes. But I had been sitting there for a couple of hours just staring at this child. Adoration. Adoration of the beauty that God has given us. God just wants a little bit of this from you and me. He wants us to look at him and know him. There is one caveat to the do not be afraid mandate or that God will deliver you from all your fears. And that caveat comes in doing bad. In other words, if you are doing something you shouldn't be doing, something that's punishable by law, then you should fear. In fact, God has given us the authorities to punish those who fear. And this is very clear in Romans 13, where it says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur 
judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. Even if you do come under condemnation from the authorities, that is not a condemnation if you're doing good that you should fear. But if you're doing wrong, in other words, if you're driving while intoxicated, if you are stealing, if you are abusing someone or abusing your position of power, and that is against the law, then when you are taken, when you are arrested, you should fear because you're being judged. Now, the good news is, is that even this, God forgives, and he may have you suffer for a while, but I would encourage you, if you know who our custodian is uh, at Peace Church, to talk with him. Uh, he spent some time in prison and was delivered uh, from that. Um, and he has a beautiful testimony of God's goodness even to the most hardened of us. So the truth is, not all fear is bad fear. Uh, but the fears that God delivers us from are the ones that we should not fear. Psalm 91 verse 3. And actually, the whole psalm is about God delivering us from our fears and the many different kinds of fears that we have. But I thought that was interesting because I thought, well, does that mean all Christians who read and quote Psalm 91 will not get COVID-19? That's interesting, isn't it? Um, if you read about being delivered from fear, there is much written in the Bible. Many, many passages. Psalms uh, goes all the way from Genesis through Revelation and there are many types of fears that they talk about, but there's pretty much two groups. The first is um, the fear of the Lord. Now, the fear of the Lord is a good thing. Uh, in fact, in Psalm 34, David talks about, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And we'll get into that uh, in another lesson. But the other type of fear is, is just fear. It's just fear of things that can harm us or that can uh, distress us. Um, in fact, God gives us fear for very good reasons. You know, if you walk to the edge of a building without a guardrail and you look over the edge and you get a sense of being afraid, there's a good reason. Because if you fall, it's going to hurt. And uh, so fear can be practical and it can be good but when it is involving things like that are outside of our control such as let's say a pestilence or let's say uh, fear of what people might think about us or fear of being able to pay the bills or fear that our children will not come back to the Lord those kind of fears are fears that God can address and offers to address. And so how, how does he do that? How does he do that? It's a very interesting question, isn't it? How does God deliver us from our fears? Does he make the object of our fears disappear? I think there have been a lot of prayers lifted about COVID-19 and yet, we still find ourselves at the time of the filming of this lesson in the midst of uh, pandemic and uh, um, isolation in many cases. So, has he delivered us from that? Well, it's a very interesting question, isn't it? Um, one 
crass teacher might say that when we know the Lord, we should have joy in every moment. Well, how can that be? How can we have joy in the moment where we are afraid of something that is looming? Something that is potentially real. And the only thing that I have found, honestly, is that when I focus my attention, getting back to the first part of Psalm 34, verse 4, when I begin to focus my attention on what God is doing here, what he wants to achieve in all of this, then my fears tend to dissipate. I'm not saying this is a magic bullet. I'm not saying that I don't have fears because that would be a lie. There are times when I do fear. But I know that my daddy in heaven, my heavenly daddy, is not sleeping. That his ears are attentive to me. That his eyes are upon me. And his promises in scripture that he will never give me more than I can bear. Do I believe that my daddy in heaven is good like that? Do I trust him? That's, that's where faith comes in. Do I trust him that he really is the good father? You know, if you've ever taught a child to swim in a pool, getting them to take that first jump from the edge of the pool into your waiting arms, even if it's just a few inches away, is really a fascinating exercise in trust, isn't it? That child, when you are right there and you have your arms up underneath their arms, they'll jump in the water because they know you've got them. But when you're a couple inches away and there's a gap, you can see even an infant, even a one-year-old, will sometimes hesitate, like, wait a minute, you're not holding me. And this is where faith comes in. This is why we're here. We're here to trust God, to develop a sense of His goodness, in the midst of hard things and to know that no matter what comes even if COVID gets us even if we get kicked out of our homes because we can't pay even if cancer takes our loved one even if that abusive person returns to my life even if I don't get to see the salvation of the Lord visited upon my children. I will trust that God is good, that he, as he says in his word, will wipe away every tear that when I get to meet him face to face, that it will make sense he will actually go through it with me and it will all make sense from his perspective and we will understand and we will love him even more because we know we have been held by the good father so be a kid on the edge of the pool and trust that dad's not going to pull his arms away when we leap Trust that He is going to be there to catch you. That He just wants to see you jump. The Lord is good. And you can on that. So stick around. Got a uh, great recipe for you to share with you. Uh, one of my favorites. Well, hi. It's Todd again.
Today's recipe is actually one that uh, Kathy and I worked on for over a year to get right, uh, believe it or not. It is a smoothie, something cool and delicious, wonderful on a warm summer's or even fall night. Um, and before you turn off this, I let me go through the ingredients and show you why this is going to be the best smoothie you ever drank. And that's actually according to one of my daughter-in-laws who loves smoothies. So you'll need some fresh fruit. Uh, I like to use uh, fresh whole frozen strawberries, uh, frozen blueberries. I like frozen mango added. It adds a nice flavor to it. And I also like a frozen banana. Add some sweetness. I will add a special ingredient, which is just a spoon of sweet orange marmalade. That'll give it some depth in its, uh, in its flavor profile. And we're going to need one of these and one of these. You're going to take the juice of a half a lemon and a half a lime, and you're going to add it to the mix. And then comes the interesting secret ingredient. And this secret ingredient is ginger beer. And not just ordinary ginger beer. We have tested a lot of ginger beers. And there's only one or two that really make this the smoothie we want it to be. We want ginger beer with a punch. So it needs to be hot, like a Blenheim's, or in this case, a Kroger ginger beer, believe it or not, is the best. These are non-alcoholic, by the way. And uh, this is hard to get now, this Kroger brand, because uh, you may know that all the Kroger stores in North Carolina basically close. So I just a shout out to our friend Cindy who got this for us from Georgia. But uh, if you don't have access to Blenheim's or to Kroger ginger beer, uh, then get yourself a, a good quality ginger ale uh, and add powdered ginger to it. You'll need to give it a while to let it dissolve, so maybe you can mix it in the bottle and shake it up and leave it overnight or something like that. But you want something with a real zing so that it, that it carries through. So, we're just simply going to put these in uh, our cup that we're going to use for the blender here. And so we're simply going to take our fruit and put it in the blender. We're then going to squeeze our lemon and lime. You're going to put in one to two tablespoons of the uh, orange marmalade. And if you don't like orange marmalade, you can use any type of preserves you'd like. And lastly, about for a single serving, about six ounces of the ginger beer. We're then going to put this in our blender and blend it up. When it's done, should be this beautiful purple color.
This will be a drink you'll be glad to serve your friends. See y'all next time. This is Todd. Bye.